Therefore, to know the historical context is to know such things as the author of the book to whom the author of the book is writing the book to. What situation the author was speaking into and what conclusion the author was trying to bring the audience towards. Knowing these elements of the historical context will provide us with a better grasp not only of what the Holy Spirit communicated to the original audience, but also to us here today because the word of God is eternally relevant. With that being said, the author of the gospel of John is John. Surprise, surprise. The same John that was a member of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, side note, for clarity, this John is not the same John as John the Baptist. We'll be talking about John the Baptist next week. This is John, the member of the 12 disciples. It just so happened that John was a very common name in the first century, just like it is today. If your name's John, raise your hand. Look at all those Johns. Wow, and they're so shy, too. <laughs> they're everywhere, I tell you. Everyone knows a John. Now, in addition to being a disciple of Jesus, John, along with his brother James and disciple Peter, were a member of what, what was called Jesus' inner circle. You could call this his cabinet. You could call this his board. But they were very close to Jesus. This inner circle had the opportunity to experience Jesus on a deeper level. For example, John was with Jesus at the transfiguration. John was with Jesus as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. John was with Jesus at the cross. John was the second person to see the empty tomb on Easter morning. And John was a witness to the resurrected Christ. And because John was in the inner circle of Jesus, his gospel reflects this deeper connection with him in that John has a very intimate and personal relationship and perspective with Jesus. And this is demonstrated by the fact that John refers to himself in his Gospels as the disciple Jesus loved or beloved disciple. Now, at first blush, this might seem a little self-serving and egotistical. For example, this would be like me referring to myself as my parents' favorite child, of which I am. And like John referring to himself as the disciple Jesus loved, this would appear equally condescending, but it's not. In fact, John's intention of using this phrase is not to draw attention to himself, but instead to highlight that of whom his gospel is written, the real Jesus Christ. Now, along the same lines as the qualifications of John for the reliability of his eyewitness account of Jesus Christ, it is important to consider that John was not only a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he was also an apostle of Jesus Christ. The context of the word apostle, the way it's used here, is that of an official title or office that's reserved for those who were selected and directly sent by Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Now, John, along with the other 12 disciples, were the original, I'm sorry, the original apostles of Jesus Christ. They were the OGs. But keep in mind, too, that there were other apostles as well. So overall, what's important to know for this series is not only was John the author of the Gospel of John, but he was also a disciple of Jesus Christ, a member of Jesus' inner circle, as well as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Next, we'll look at who the original audience was that John was writing to, as well as the situation that John was speaking into. These two questions go hand in hand. What makes the apostle John so unique as compared to his fellow apostles is that when he died, he died an old man. In other words, John's natural death was much unlike that of the early death and martyrdom of his fellow apostles. And it was in this older age that the apostle John wrote his gospel. And his audience, 
was primarily the Christians in Ephesus. You see, in the late first century, John lived with a community of Christians in the big city of Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. Now, the big question is, why was John in Turkey and not in his homeland of Israel? And the answer to that question was because there was a war going on between the Romans and the Jews, and it was taking place in Israel. And as this war continued, Jerusalem was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed. This all happened in about 70 AD. And as a result, the Israeli Jews were scattered across the Mediterranean regions, as well as that of Europe, of which included the Apostle John. Now, as far as the big city of Ephesus, many decades prior to John's arrival, the apostle Paul had planted many churches in Ephesus, and these churches flourished. And John moved to one of these Christian communities. And shortly after John's arrival, John noticed the tension that existed between the Christian church and the Jewish synagogues or the Jewish church. The reason for the tension was that the Christians were evangelizing to the Jews and the Jews were converting to Christianity and the Jewish leaders hated this because they were losing people. And as you can imagine, as a result, there was ongoing tension between the Jewish leadership and the Christians on the question, who is the real Jesus? Christians said he's the living Messiah. The Jews said he's a dead revolutionary. Which is it? Who is the real Jesus? And so enters the famous Apostle John, the goat of the disciples. This would be like Tom Brady coming out of retirement to lead your Minnesota Vikings to their first Super Bowl championship. Never thought I'd say this, but Tom, stay retired. We have Sam Darnold. <laughs> and this was a big deal. This was a big deal because the Apostle John had a lot of credibility. Not only was he a disciple of Jesus, not only was he an apostle of Jesus, not only was he an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ, but John was a Jew. He was born a Jew, and he converted to Christianity. He was a Jewish Christian. He could speak both sides of the argument. He could speak their language. So he had some major credibility to speak into this debate, of which he did by writing his eyewitness account of Jesus, also known as the Gospel of John. Now, what makes the Gospel of John so unique as compared to the other Gospels is not only the perspective of the Apostle John, but also that of the audience for which it was written. In that John's Gospel is written to second and third generation Christians outside of Israel. Meaning John's audience are those who are living in a heavily Greek-influenced culture that's primary language is Koine Greek and living in the Greek-influenced city of Ephesus. And at the time, John's gospel provided not only a new point of view, but a new point of view for a new audience so that they could confidently know who the real Jesus was. The final question to ask for the historical context of the Gospel of John is, what is the conclusion that John is drawing the audience towards? The ultimate purpose of John in writing his Gospel is actually recorded in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. And it says this. The disciples saw Jesus do many things other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. The you in this passage are the Ephesian Christians. 
You see, the conclusion that John wanted to bring the Ephesian Christians to was that of confidence in their debate with the Jews and knowing that the real Jesus is the Messiah, he truly is the Son of God, and that if they continue to believe in him, they will have eternal life. So now that we have the historical context for the gospel of John, we can, with the time we have left, move into the opening text of John. If you have your Bibles, either in print or on your phone, I encourage you to open them to John chapter 1. I am reading from the New Living Translation here today. And as you look up this chapter, I want to preface how John opens his gospel in that he is very poetic. He has a very poetic way of describing the real Jesus. And let me warn you, this can be a little hard to follow, but we'll do our best. Again, keep in mind the miraculous things John is highlighting of Jesus here in this introduction. John 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God. In these opening words, you may notice a similarity to that of the opening of Genesis in the phrase, in the beginning, is used. But instead of moving into, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth like in Genesis, John declares that in the beginning, the word already existed. Now, the use of the phrase, the word, capital W, is a very complex philosophical concept that would have spoken clearly and directly to the Greek culture of the Christians in Ephesus. Now, for simplicity's sake, think of the concept of the word as three practical expressions of God. First, the word is the creative expression of God. Second, the word is the personality of God. And third, the word is the ultimate revelation of God. In other words, the concept of the word is used by John to pertain to Jesus, of which Jesus is all three of these expressions of God. Like I said, it's complicated, but this would have spoken clearly to John's original audience. Let's move on to something simple like the origins of time. Now, specifically what John is referring to in the text about Jesus is that he existed with God before time. I know this sounds a little sci-fi. You got any Doctor Who fans in here? Usually louder ones, maybe not so much. Back to the future, guys? Not so much? Okay, I won't do that at the third service. Um, Anyway, I hate to go sci-fi on you here, but God created time. God created time, just like God created the universe. And God lives outside of his creation of time and that he is not subject to its rules. A question to ask here is, What's the point? And the point is, is that Jesus existed before time with God as an expression of God. Therefore, the real Jesus is God. You see, John goes back further than Jesus born in a manger, like that of Matthew and Luke. John is saying, yes, Jesus came to earth born in a manger. But before time, Jesus was. And what's really cool is when later in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers back to his pre-existence when he refers to himself as I am, which is the same name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am, which is profound and really cool stuff. And we'll get more into this in the next few months. Continuing in verse 3. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light 
to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Again, so much going on here, but let's study what we can with the time we have left. In verses 3 through 5, John is referring here to the beginning of time, which for you and I is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John notes that it's through Jesus that God's creative expression in Jesus created everything. And into creation... Through Jesus, as the creative expression of God, Jesus gave life. And not only that, but also it was through Jesus' earthly life that light was brought into the darkness. So again, what's the point? The point is that the purpose of the real Jesus, the personality and ultimate revelation of God, the real Jesus came to this earth to be a light in the darkness. Or in other words, as God's perfect creation was overtaken by the free will of man to sin, Jesus became fully God and fully man to become light in the darkness, to give his life as the perfect sacrifice for humanity to be free from the darkness of sin. And what this verse concludes with is that there is nothing that the darkness of sin can do to stop Jesus from fulfilling his purpose and his mission. And this is where John is headed with the rest of his gospel. John in his introduction is showing how the real Jesus existed with God before time began that the real Jesus is God, that the real Jesus is the creative expression, personality, and ultimate revelation of God, and that this real Jesus was going to bring freedom from sin by bringing light into the darkness. The real Jesus is headed towards the cross. And as we close here today, We go back to where we started here this morning with the deduction that you really don't know someone until you spend time with them. And my question for you to consider this morning and these next few months as we go through this sermon series is, do you know the real Jesus? Have you taken the time to get to know him? Or do you know him from a distance, by reputation? And the good news is that if you know Jesus only by reputation, only from a distance, the good news is that we get to spend time directly with him over the next few months as we take this deep dive into the gospel of John. And my encouragement for you is to not only keep coming to church or watching online, but also to spend time with Jesus by reading in your Bible along with the sermon series. For example, between now and next week, read chapters 1 and chapter 2 of John. Read it a few times. And just follow along in the Bible. Week by week, chapter by chapter as we study and learn more about Jesus, the real Jesus as is reflected in Scripture. God promises that if you come closer to Him, then He will come closer to you. This is a guarantee that if you move closer to God, by reading his word, by spending time in prayer, by continuing to go to church or watch online, God will come closer to you. And as a result, by the end of this series, it's my prayer, it's my hope that if you commit to this, 
you will be able to confidently answer the question, do you know the real Jesus with a resounding yes, I know the real Jesus.